I'm going to try to do a little different format here. I'm using my GoPro and um, some kind person brought down for me an adapter for a little microphone. Uh, let me show you that microphone. try my hand at covering some news articles give you some idea of what's going on here and what's important here so I've chose a few uh, that's come out in the past week and maybe if this uh, works out well for you you can let me know uh, send me some comments and maybe we can do this every week okay the first one here um, let's see if we can put it up one of these places Proof of insurance date for foreigners pushed back again. Some attorneys predict the requirement will be dropped altogether. Um, probably so. I have railed against this for well over a year now, uh, claiming that it's unconstitutional. Uh, but what we have is a couple things have been determined, and it was I touched on it quickly in a video recently. They have decided that for anyone coming here under 90 days, tourists uh, will not have this requirement. So that we know now. And the implementation that they have just announced will be July 22nd for when uh, proof is going to be required. Now, they keep postponing this. Uh, the last deadline was in February. It's been going on since last year. They keep postponing it because it does violate their constitution. And uh, let me see what I can find here. Okay, what this article says, we'll quote, according to some immigration attorneys, the health insurance requirement may never be implemented. There's a good reason why they keep delaying it. It violates the health care access provision in the constitution. She adds that a lawsuit currently before the Constitutional Court challenges several parts of the immigration law, including the health care requirement. There are no plans to develop the databases necessary to track compliance with the insurance requirement. Remember, um, I have to brag here a little bit. I've posted that up uh, many moons ago when people were running around trying to scramble and take proof to Azogis and different offices, and I said that they have no way to track it, so you're just wasting your time. It's an exercise in futility, and oh my God, I got blasted, and how do you know? You don't know what you're talking about, and it just went on and on, and I got lots of hate mail. Except I knew that. They don't have a way to track it, and what was happening is just to appease people, they acted like they were doing something. They might put a stamp on it, hand you back a copy, they were going in the circular file, or at least in cardboard boxes for some later date. There's no way to record it. They had just purchased this software system within the last couple years. It cost a small fortune. Actually, it cost a large fortune, and they weren't about to go out and buy another one just for this. So there's several problems with this. We shall see. Okay, the next article I'm going to cover, U.S. DEA to provide assistance in Ecuador's fight against drug traffickers. Uh, just a little background, the last president despised the United States and everything it stood for because he was a self-proclaimed socialist. His best buddies were in Cuba and Venezuela and Bolivia. And anything that he could do to the United States to put his thumb in their eye, he would do. And one of the things was to expel a, a very small base that was in Manta on the coast, and he got rid of them. Uh, if you talk to anybody on the coast, they sorely miss it. It was a good source of income. There wasn't any problems, but for political reasons, they were booted out. And it was proclaimed those Yankee capitalist, imperialist, nasty whatevers would never set foot on this country's soil again. 
Well, that's all well and good, but we have a new president, and while he also is a self-proclaimed socialist, he's actually a pragmatist, and I have yet to see anything that he does related to socialism. It seems that he's making his decisions based on what is probably best for the people of Ecuador, which is as it should be. And one of those things is we have this drug situation on the border between Ecuador and Colombia. Now, we've got some politicians that are blaming Colombia for this, which is absolutely ridiculous. This drug problem goes back many, many decades. And if we think back to the time of Pablo Escobar, when he began, they weren't growing coca in Colombia. It was actually coming up out of Peru and Bolivia, and lo and behold, it was passing through Ecuador. And then eventually they began growing it in Colombia to stop that long train. But how was it getting through? Well, it was getting through because back in those days it was an extremely corrupt government and payoffs were everywhere. You could argue, and it's actually a pretty good argument, that Pablo Escobar and the drug trade of Colombia never would have become the giant that it became if Ecuador never allowed that to pass through. Now that's ancient history. So let's roll it ahead to say two years ago. Two years ago, the drug trade here in Ecuador, they were committing bombings in Guayaquil. They were threatening judges for uh, the drug sentences that they were levying. Uh, I don't know if people remember, but you go back one or two years, this was pretty well known. Let's roll back to a few weeks ago. They had a bombing on the border, and all of a sudden you have politicians, because they don't, don't blame me, they're telling the people of Ecuador that this is a, a Colombian issue and it's spilling over their borders and this didn't exist in Ecuador. It's always existed in Ecuador. Now, whether the government turned a blind eye, whether the government was getting paid off, and when those bombs went off uh, some time ago, that was to send a message, don't mess with us, we've got an agreement. I guess I can't officially say that, but it's existed here. Who are these drug people in Colombia? Well, there are some Colombians, there's Ecuadorians, there's Cubans, there's Mexicans. This drug problem is not a problem of a country. This drug problem is a problem of criminals infecting whatever is convenient for them. And I think that's the way it needs to be looked at. Instead of incriminating or blaming Ecuador or blaming Colombia or any other particular country, because the people of those countries don't want this, it's really appropriate to turn that focus on the criminals themselves. And if they don't represent any country, they represent the crime that they're committing. Now, this news article talks about this new president, who is a pragmatist, as I mentioned. He has announced that he is welcoming information and assistance from the US DEA and all the intelligence sources they have on some of these particular people, which is a very smart thing because everybody who is suffering from these criminals really should get together, pool their resources, share information, and crush them. So this was, in my opinion, very good news. To those that fear that it's opening the door for the United States to move their military in, I mean seriously, the United States really doesn't need to have any kind of military presence in Ecuador. I frankly, I doubt they really could care less. Especially when you look and see Colombia is very friendly and would allow it, yet we still don't have big bases there. Uh, Panama is right next door, so any kind of basing that we need can be done in Panama. So, you know, I think that's just a paranoid, you know, let's complain about conspiracies. This last one, it's actually pretty funny, but it's a little on the sad side. Larger taxis needed to handle luggage and enormous gringos, co-op says. Co-op is the taxi cooperative. Now, they can't just go out and buy a car and make it a taxi. 
Because the government controls a lot of aspects of the society, it's not surprising, they also determine what taxis you can have and what you can't have. So they make an approved taxi, and SUVs are not part of that. Taxi drivers want to upgrade. They, the luggage argument makes perfect sense. If you're a taxi and you're servicing the airport, having a little Nissan Sentra or a little Hyundai, maybe it's not going to accommodate two or three people that get in and they all three have two suitcases that weigh 50 pounds each. It's not gonna cut it. And so that's problematic. It is not only insulting, but it's ludicrous, the statement about having to accommodate enormous gringos. First of all, have they looked around Cuenca lately? There's fatty bobatties everywhere, and they're not just gringos. There's just, you look at my videos and you look in the background, there's fat people all over the place. You know, when they're having a lot of sodas and carbohydrates all day long, and you know, they're not working the fields anymore, similar to what happened in the United States, um, you know, you tend to start to see more fat people. Now, gringos do tend to be tall, and that can be a problem for some. It's not a problem for me, I'm five foot 10. And I get in taxis and it's perfectly okay. And I can sit in the back seat with two other people and I'm, I'm no Slim Jim. So, you know, it's, it's a ridiculous argument. It is pretty insulting because they, this co-op specifically said it was, you know, gringos and they're too fat, they're enormous. And, uh, and so they need to get big taxis because of that. And it's just absurd. So that's three articles that came out this week that may or may not be of interest to you. Um, again, let me know if it is of interest. Make some comments down below uh, so that I know whether I should do this maybe every week or so. It will also be interesting to see how the lighting is here, sitting here like this. It's easy for me to look at my laptop with information. I don't have to... Uh, constantly have my notebook and I can't, can you see that? I can't read my own writing where here on the laptop. So hopefully this will work out and I can do it this way a little bit more and it might make it a little less disjointed, maybe. So that's it for rambling on for today. I will see you soon. Here's